This is a special adoption program. The provincial government feels that this program is essential. For the past five years, the number of children in care of the Department of Welfare has been increasing by approximately 180 a year. This trend is causing us real concern. While we have had reasonable success in placing white children for adoption, we have had great difficulty in placing Indian and Métis children. Paternalism, racism, the belief that their uh, culture and, and value system is superior to ours. But you see, as you get older, that longing to know where you're from, uh, who your brothers and sisters are, and, and to reconnect with that side of your family because that's, that's what's missing. Something's missing from you. I really began to, to take on you know, this, these unwritten rules in terms of survival. Don't talk, don't feel, whatever you do, don't trust and don't open up because that just meant the threat of moving on to another home. Canadians, for the most part, people in Saskatchewan had little understanding of First Nations and Métis history aside from a very white supremacist approach. Little was known about the treaties, little was known about the Indian Act, and so what people had to go on was what they were, what advertisement told them. I couldn't even cry because I was so angry, I was so frustrated, and I could feel me saying to myself, I don't care if they kill me, they will have to kill me to keep my children. After all, Indian and Métis children have the same potential as white. The only difference is the color of their skin. My name is Robert Doucette. I am originally a Mackay from uh, Northwest Saskatchewan. I was born February 28, 1962. I am of Cree, Métis, Dene ancestry. Uh, I was um, taken away when I was four months old. I think one of the reasons why was was because uh, Firstly, my mother was Aboriginal. She's Métis. And uh, the Canadian and, and the provincial governments have a long standing, uh, they've got a long standing goal to assimilate Aboriginal people. I think, I think uh, that racist notion that they could raise our kids better than us predominated. You know, growing up, you're always called Chief and Nietzsche and, you know, Breed, all, all of these. Uh, and you wonder, well, why am I being called this? And uh, you come to understand that you're, you're not part of, really part of that family. You're from somewhere else. And, uh, and then you start uh, creating mechanisms to cope with all of this stuff to survive. There was a century of racial bias on the part of many non-Indigenous families in Saskatchewan, in Canada. It's no, it's no secret that uh, First Nations and Métis people were perceived as um, less than white. White supremacy was very common in Canada. My name is Allison Stevenson. I am a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples and Global Social Justice at the University of Regina. I'm in the Department of Politics and International Studies. As a 
Métis adoptee. I, am, I have a personal experience with adoption. Although I wasn't scooped, I was um, voluntarily relinquished by my birth mother. And so the injustice around colonization and the, you know, the continued oppression of Indigenous families is something that continues to motivate me. It appears as though families knew very little about what was happening to their children in some cases. There were evidence of scoopings where children were just simply taken and lost into the so-called so system. The official, as in the government, justifications for the adoption, the increasing emphasis on adoption, was the high numbers of children that were coming into care that were so-called languishing in foster care. So adoption was seen as a better answer to a lifetime of living in foster care. The only picture I have of myself was the photo taking down in Regina at their head office of the Department of Social Services. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And you can see already at age three and a half, I was through nine foster homes. And after nine foster homes, really, what does a child have to smile about? My name is uh, Jackie Marie Maurice from Meadow Lake and Green Lake Erie in Saskatchewan here. And uh, I do identify as Métis. Yet, once you begin to hear my story, it wasn't always that way, and that wasn't always common knowledge for me. I was scooped right from birth from Meadow Lake Union Hospital and uh, made a permanent ward of the government. And in my particular case, I wasn't made registered for adoption, so that meant I went through numerous foster homes. There were lots of um, physical traumas, sexual traumas. There was a lot of spiritual abuse in that foster home, and I stayed there for about seven years. But that feels like a lifetime for a child. And then even then, I began to even close down. You know, by the age of nine and 10, really age nine was the first, first attempt on my young life. And I always say, you know, I was probably age nine, almost 10 years old, but I felt like 110 because of my, my experiences. And I really felt not heard. Have you ever considered adopting a child? Many couples have found their happiness through AIM. So the AIM program, AIM is an acronym for the Adopt Indian and Métis program. It started as a pilot in Saskatchewan in 1967 and it was funded by the federal government initially. And so it, the goal was to um, really demonstrate that First Nations and Métis children were adoptable, that they could become potential family members for non-Indigenous families. AIM is a division of the Department of Welfare, established as a placement service for Indian and Métis children. AIM, 2340 Albert Virginia. All inquiries handled promptly and in confidence. So it was really almost an experiment, so to speak. Um, and it was found to be quite successful. Uh, the, the rates of children adopted, while they weren't enormous, they demonstrated a, an upward tick. So this said to the government that advertising of Indigenous children with particular types of images successfully stimulates transracial adoption. In my family, they've tried to help me understand what happened and how they felt. And one of the things that happened uh, about three years ago, four years ago, I was at my mother's place in Lakwabish, and she said to me, you know, I've got something for you. So she says, I've kept her all these years. So she went to the closet and she came out and she, uh, she brought this and she said, this is the sweater they took off you when they scooped you, the day they scooped you. And I've kept it now for 53 years. And on your birthday, I would, I would bring it out and I would hold it and smell it to remind myself that I had a son out there. And uh, 
that I loved him and we wanted him back. And she gave this to me. This is a sweater that this my mother kept for 53 years to remind herself that she had a 60 scoop son. No. Uh, if, there, if anything I've learned from that is that my mother did want me back. The more and more I came to understand the 60 scoop, the more and more I came to see it as, as cultural genocide of First Nations and Métis people in Canada. Carolyn Bennett announced that uh, they were settling and apologizing and, uh, and she said that they were just dealing with First Nations in England. The more and more I came to understand the 60 scoop, the more and more I came to see it as, as cultural genocide of First Nations and Métis people in Canada. It was really never designed to care for Indigenous children. Being a child of the, you know, 60s scoop, it's like I was ready to die of a broken heart. But that's really what it feels like. It's such a loss. It's like the loss of a limb that can never be replaced. The thing is, you can't forget about this stuff. And uh, you carry it with you every day because you've lost it. And as far as forgiving, who do, who do I forgive? The whole idea of uh, being with, with your biological family is a huge thing for anybody. Growing up with their values and their languages and their beliefs and uh, the way they live. And uh, when you take that away from somebody, they can, most in most instances, they can't ever get that back. At least the memories they can. She said to me that, uh, you know, we've been looking for you for 20 years, Robert, and uh, your mushroom would always say to us, could you go and find uh, go and find my little man. I want to see him before he dies. He died uh, two years prior to uh, me meeting you. So I never did get to meet my grandma and grandpa, my mushroom and cook them. And as you can see, kind of, <laughs> it bothers me. Eh? The first time I met him was in the archives. I uh, do a lot of research in the archives and I, I uh, found a picture and it says, uh, Happy Matey Grandfather, and uh, the caption said that, and here it says underneath it, Celestine Makaya, Buffalo and Arrows, and he's surrounded by 
all the rest of his grandkids, except one. People wanted to know, even systems want to know, who is your next of kin? What is your family history in terms of health issues, right? So these were a lot of unanswered questions for me, and a lot of times I just had a lot of shame and a lot of pain in, in terms of trying to respond to those questions and not let on my experience of being a only a foster child or a nobody's child. You know, it wasn't until through the help of a lawyer and really being persistent and determined that when social services released me a few case summaries that I found out on black on white that I was of Métis ethnic origin, that my maternal grandparents were of Métis ethnic origin, and that my maternal mother and biological father were of Métis ethnic origin. So I finally had the proof in the pudding, if you will. And so that's what started that search, an inner search for me. There are really no supports or services to facilitate a reunion. You know, we're left to our own devices after we have been systemically robbed of our life skills, of skills of relating, of skills that say this is where we come from, this is our identity. I had none of those skills. And really, my biological mother, she was on a whole different um, level, you know, in, in her own journey. For First Nations people, um, it was it was certainly didn't reflect their understanding of their children, and for Métis people, it was the same. It it, would, it reflected badly on themselves as parents, on their communities, and so as a result of the AIM program, there was a um, a very intensive resistance, especially by Métis Métis leaders in our in our province and Indigenous women. In response to the AIM ads, it was Métis people that were the first to begin a letter writing campaign, organizing around it, meeting together, um, formulating plans for Métis foster homes, getting the Métis community to think about fostering kids. Um, that was the ways in which they started to um, demand that their children come back to the communities and they take, take back that, that role in a sense of caring caring for children and caring for families and rebuilding those families that had been broken up. They've taken a lot of our people, they've taken a lot of lives, they've taken a lot of babies, they've taken a number of things. But for the ones that had that strength to move on, they now seen that they couldn't kill us. They couldn't take who we were as Métis and, and First Nation people. They couldn't, they couldn't wipe us out. I'm known as uh, Senator Elder Nora Cummings, and I'm a Métis Senator. This is my home. I'm a road allowance Métis. I lived in Saskatoon all my life, and we, had, we lived on a road allowance here. We told them, you have to take these ads away because they're all our children, all our little brown faces, and they're like little puppy dog, little so-and-so is well-trained, little so-and-so now is able to read, little so and all these kind of things. And I thought, how degrading this is. You do that to my children, let me tell you, it wouldn't work. So we did, we stopped that. We got that stopped. We got them stopped taking over the border.
Peter and Bennett announced that uh, they were settling and apologizing and uh, and she said that they were just dealing with First Nations in England. And I was shocked, man. Um, and in a real state of disbelief, really in a state of disbelief because how could this happen again? The government isn't off the hook because no, it's not just about financial compensation. How can you put a dollar value on the number of traumas and losses that have happened for many of us, really? Shame on a system that has taken away a child's most valuable resource, family, an extended family and community. And no dollar amount can replace that. As far as I'm concerned, if they really want to work with us as people, they cannot work with our politicians. It should be within our communities. The communities are the ones that they should be working with because those communities are the ones that are looking after our families, our family members are in there. They know what is needed in those communities. First Nations and Métis people still have to really argue that, you know, strongly that it's their right to care for their children, that it's their responsibility to care for their children, and that they can do the best job for their children. It's really having to um, create a new narrative around who's the best to care for Indigenous children. I look at it this way, that while we're here, let's make some very good choices. Let's help the next generation get to the place where they need to be so that they can ascend and ensure that that uh, what has happened to us uh, doesn't continue. To our lost children who are beginning and continuing their journey home, for those who have not yet found their voice, their stories, their belonging, their identity and relations, may our lost children find their own strength courage and voice within so that they may never need to walk alone again. They would.